Hey guys, this is Darren. Welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. I am really excited to publish this episode. It covers a topic we haven't really delved into much on the show, and that is, do you need to quit your job to get an MBA? And I brought on Chris Healy, who is the head of MBA marketing and recruitment for the Alliance Manchester Business School. And they have a whole suite of professional MBA programs. So I thought he would be the perfect person uh, to talk about different options, what you as an applicant should know about these programs from a curriculum standpoint, from an ROI standpoint. We cover a lot of different uh, things in this conversation. And I think you'll walk away with it with a really good idea of what are the key questions to ask when you're doing your research for professional MBAs. And I will let you find those out in the episode. If you need help with school selection, go head over to touchmba.com. We'd be happy to give you some free school selection help over there. And this episode has inspired me to look more into providing better advice for those of you who are looking at professional MBAs or part-time MBAs. Uh, There's many words for them, professional, part-time, blended, online, but I think we can do a better job at Touch MBA helping helping this audience as well. So anyways, go head over to touchmba.com if you need some help. I'd like to introduce my next guest. He's head of MBA marketing and recruitment for the Alliance Manchester Business School, the University of Manchester. He's been on the Touch MBA podcast before. I want to welcome back Chris Healy. Chris, welcome back. Hi, Darren. Thanks for thanks for having me again. Yeah. So, Chris, what I really wanted to talk about in this episode is the evolution of the professional MBA. And what I want what I mean by that is, do you have to quit your job to get an MBA? Right, with all the new technological advances globalization, new student needs, and of course, new company needs. You know, I'm curious to know how business schools are adapting to serve this customer, to serve this sort of student. Because I know Manchester has a lot of different programs for MBA students. So my first question to you is, yeah, I mean, maybe you could uh, give an overview for us about how the market for the professional MBA student the working MBA student has evolved? Yeah, absolutely. I can do that, Darren. So, I mean, I've I've been working in business education now for almost 15 years. When I started in in the industry, of course, full-time MBA programs uh, were huge. They are still huge in 2020. But for those who didn't want to commit to a full-time MBA, you know, 15, 20, even, even, even 10 years ago to an extent. The options, I think, were pretty limited, or if not limited, they were certainly traditional. So what you had was your traditional executive MBA programs. And when I say traditional executive MBAs, I mean they are uh, the type of programs aimed at, aimed at professionals with, on average, you know, minimum of 10 years of professional experience, on average about 15 years of professional experience. And it was quite a commitment and it's still, you know, still, still is a commitment. You had, you know, some of the top executive MBAs in the world, you are looking at um, attending between a 15 and 24 month period, you know, anywhere between 60, 70 to even up to a 90 days of face-to-face commitment. Now, with that amount of uh, face-to-face commitment also comes comes a very high program cost as well. And those options have been around for, you know, the executive MBA has been around for many years. It is still popular now. When I meet with when I meet with candidates, I actually I actually met with a candidate uh, this Monday, and I offered him this advice that I'll that, that I'll share now with your listeners. If you're in a position uh, where you can commit to say 80, 90 days of face-to-face contact time over a 15 to 24 month period, and if your employer is happy for you to be out of the office for 70, 80, 90 days, 
and you have the the, the funding for such a program. A traditional executive MBA is still still a very very good viable option. The reality is though. Not many people are able to commit to that amount of face-to-face -face contact in such a, sport, such a short space of time. Or the reality is their employers don't want them out of the office for that, for that amount of time. I think you can, you can see there with regards to the decrease in the amount of employers who are funding students or in funding their employees on those traditional executive MBAs. Also, when I when I started in the industry, what was also very popular were, were the traditional part-time MBAs. So those traditional part-time MBAs were focused around you maybe attending two or three hours on a Tuesday evening, two or three hours on a Thursday evening. Uh, perhaps you'd be coming in, uh, you know, one Saturday every every three weeks or every couple of weeks, for example. And the interesting thing about those programs, because we because because we had a program like that, uh, the Manchester Part Time MBA, and this story here will resonate with all business schools across the world because. You know whether we're talking about Manchester, whether we're talking about schools in San Francisco, whether we're talking about schools in in Lagos, Nigeria, whether we're talking about schools in Shanghai. Every every major city will have a top business school that generally has still has uh, this type of traditional part time MBA. But what you'll find there is it is a very very local audience because of the way that program is structured. You can only recruit people around the Manchester vicinity, around the northwest of, of England. Uh, if I use the San Francisco example, you can only recruit people who are based in and around San Francisco. And equally, that, that, that would, I would say the same about every city because it's just not convenient for you to, well, okay, let, let's talk about Asia, go from Beijing to Shanghai three times a week. It's just you know, it's not really viable as well as doing a, a, a full time job. And I think you're starting to see the popularity of those traditional part time MBAs decrease in in the industry. Some schools still have successful programs and I think they will continue to have those, but you are and will continue to see a drop in those types of numbers. And then what has happened in more recent times is there have been programs where I think they are more flexible, um, maybe more accessible for professionals across the world. You mentioned there about the techn technological advancements. There's a lot more in terms of online learning capabilities now than there was 15, 20 years ago. So now you've you know, we've we've already discussed how you've got a program that might be ninety days in due in ninety days face to face contact. Now we'll couple that with fully online MBA programs. I was reading a piece of research recently to say three years ago there were a hundred and sixty online MBAs in the US market. There are now over three hundred fully online MBAs in the in the US market. So that shows that there's certainly growth. People people like the opportunity to study online. Uh, it means you are out of the office. Uh, you, your your commitments out of the office are a lot are, are a lot less. Um, so those online MBA programs you are seeing more and more of them. Um, as I said, yes, they are very popular. But sometimes you do also have to consider, um, yes, there's convenience of not being out of the office, but do you miss out on some elements of that face-to-face -face, face -face contact? For some candidates, they will like the idea of fully online. Other candidates will still want face-to-face -face contact. And then that brings us to uh, the next sort of program, which would be what I would class as a as a maybe a distance MBA that's not fully online, where you might have a week at the start of the program where you would be 
at that business school along with your fellow students, and it might be a week at the end of the MBA. So in a two-year period, you might be on campus between 10 to 14 days. And again, that sort of program proving to be very, very popular in the market. Uh, for example, one of our partners over in the US, uh, Kelly School of Business, their Kelly Direct program um, is a, a fantastic example of uh, of an MBA that has some face-to-face contact where it's structured at the start and and at the end. Um, and then that also brings us to then what I would class as more of a blended learning or you know an, almost a, an amalgamation of of all those types of MBAs that we've that we've discussed. So um, when I started uh, at Alliance Manchester Business School back in 2006, we did have at the time a very innovative um, professional MBA, uh, which which was and is still called our Manchester Global MBA. We launched that program in 1992. So we were very much the pioneers in terms of finding different flexible formats for professionals looking to study, looking to study an MBA. Um, And what we did with our model is we focused it. Yes, we wanted to deliver it in Manchester, but we also wanted to deliver the program in other parts of the world. So we began setting up two uh, MBA campuses in Singapore and and Hong Kong. Over the years, we have grown. Um, we now have our global campuses in Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, Shanghai, Sao Paulo. Over the years, we've uh, we've been in other locations around the world as well. So in terms of transnational education on the in the MBA market as I said you know we're very much the pioneers in that and that is reflected in terms of how many students we've got on our Manchester Global MBA Uh, for example we've got around 2,000 current students uh, currently studying at the program. So those, some of those who may may have started in January, to those who are about to complete their live business projects, and I think one of the reasons for the success of that program and the growth in other programs that are, for want of a better word, trying to replicate the model that we that we that we pioneered, is that we feel that we've got the right amount of face-to-face contact time. So we sit in between that uh, distance of 10 to 14 days and those 60, 70, 80 days from a traditional executive MBA. So you've got programs like our program now where you come on campus around 30 days over a a two-year period. That works for professionals around the world, for other business schools who've got similar programs, because that is doable, irrespective of where in the world you live. Um, At Manchester Business School, we've got students who will fly to Manchester three times a year from LA, from Johannesburg, um, from over 100 countries, actually. Uh, And again, I, my my colleagues from other schools who have got similar programs will all be able to say the same. And the reason for that is because of the way these programs are structured. You come on campus three times per year and it he, and he, and he works very well for the individual. It works very well for the employer. Um, and also from a personal point of view, because the personal, you know, if, a student's family life is also integral when they undertake an MBA. So you can't just focus purely on your uh, on, on the professional and on the on the study side of things. You need to think how how undertaking an MBA is going to affect your personal stroke family life. And when you have a program, and and when you've got programs on the market that almost sit in between that traditional executive and uh, what some of the online MBA programs, 
it works very well for candidates. So I think that's, uh, I guess, a, uh, a brief snapshot of how I've seen the professional MBA market evolve over the last 10, 15 years. Now, that's fantastic. And I have so many questions to, to ask from that. So my first one is, of course, applicants are paying a premium to get an MBA degree. They're, they're looking for ROI, right? And I'm wondering how employers see the professional MBA. What, what have you seen in the market? Has it changed? Do, are they respecting the degree more, even with these you know, more flexible formats? Like, can someone with your part, you know, global part-time MBA you know, command as much respect in the market? So that's a, that's, a, that's a great question, Darren. So what we have always said um, at Manchester, and I think the same uh, can be said for a number of my colleagues, certainly not all of my colleagues, but uh, again, this is a piece of advice for, for your listeners here, is on the, our ethos at Manchester is we've got one MBA program. Although we've got three different types, there's one MBA qualification. So if you do a full-time MBA at Manchester, if you do the Manchester Global MBA, everyone graduates with the exact same qualification, which is simply a Master's of Business Administration from the University of Manchester. We have the same curriculum in terms of the core courses, in in terms of the electives. There are differences in terms of the projects. The academics are the same, and you are seeing that, again, more and more schools are thinking in that way. So if you can then articulate that to to employers, that's part of the individual students have to do that, but also the business schools have to do that in terms of when our careers teams are speaking with their corporate clients say, yeah, yeah, of course, we've got the full-time MBA, which full-time MBA programs generally lead to structured MBA hiring programs, a part-time, distance, executive, etc. Students generally don't go into that structured MBA hiring program. One of the reasons for that, I think, is the profile of students. You know, the the average age of students on your traditional executive MBAs, even the average age of students on our Manchester Global MBAs is around 36, whereas on full-time programs, it's a, it's a lot less. It's generally mid to late 20s. So on those structured hiring MBA programs, employers are looking perhaps, not all the time, of course, uh, but of course, they are looking for individuals that they can still nurture who may not have as much experience as a as a uh, exe- professional MBA student. But what you tend to find with those who embark on professional MBAs is that they already in industries that they either they are successful in or they have had success in or that they feel that they can uh, aim for success, that it's, a, it's an attractive industry to be in, um, or that they might be in an organization where they can visibly see that there's growth in that organization. Uh, and if they undertake an MBA, that is going to help them to get to the next stage and to the next stage after that. That is why often employers um, fund MBA programs, for example, on I I, I mentioned about how you read now and see a lot of articles about less employers paying for employees to do the traditional executive MBA, whereas on our Manchester Global MBA, 40% of the students who come onto that program are sponsored by their their employers. And that is because the... Yes, the employer will like the structure of the program, the business school, etc. But they will also want to invest in that individual because they see that individual progressing uh, within within the company. And then for those 60% who are funding the program themselves, 
again, they will still be thinking they, 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 they may stay in that organization or they may move to a competitor organization uh, to be more highly remunerated and they look at the NBA as an investment. What you don't see happening as much in the professional NBA markets that you do in the full-time one is people switching industries uh, constantly. Uh, you know, when I, when I meet candidates and if they say, if they say they want to switch industries, generally a full-time MBA is the best route for that because it just happens time and time again. Whereas on the professional MBA, it's not something that is continuously happening. Yes, it does happen, but I don't think, I would never recommend anyone to purely take a professional MBA for the sole reason of completely switching job functions, industries. Yes, it can happen, but you need to have, I think, other reasons why you would be doing it as opposed to just that one sole reason. No, absolutely. And I think another key aspect of what applicants are looking for is, of course, who they meet, right? Who their classmates are, who, who alumni of the school are. And of course, during a full-time program, you know, I think those bonds are, are cemented quite tightly. You're, you're seeing your classmates a lot. And so I'm wondering if, for example, I choose to take your, your global part-time MBA and, you know, I'm in, have that face-to-face -face contact, like, what did you say? It's 14 days a year? So in the first year, it's 17 days. And in the um, second year, it's 13 days. There you go. Yeah. So 17 the first year, 13 the next year. I'm wondering, yeah, how tight and connected your um, professional MBA students feel with the program and, um, you know, how tied into your alumni networks they are as well. Mm. So that goes back to, you know, one of the ways we started the conversation when we were talking more about the evolution of the professional MBA. And I said to you that online MBAs work very, very well for some, for some individuals. Uh, and the testament to that is the growth in the number of, of online MBAs being offered. For those who, who decide against an online MBA, Often it is because of that network. They feel, yes, of course, you can interact online, but people still like that face-to-face that face -face element. So one of, the, one of the things that we find very important, and we did this because of feedback, actually, from our students. The feedback of the quality of our teaching has always been extremely high. But when we were looking into the detail, what we were potentially lacking was I guess what you would class that extracurricular after the after the classes are finished on our professional MBA programs. So often what would happen is you know they might you might be in class 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. so very very intensive residential periods when you're on campus uh, and you are assessed during that in group presentations. And often what we found was the uh, there was so much work that had to go into that that the groups were just staying together, working with each other up until, you know, 10, 11, midnight. And we thought, okay, an MBA, all MBAs should be challenging. So we still need to in ensure that's there. But what we wanted to do was to free up a couple of evenings when they were on campus. And that would be to have the specific networking events. So we tried to, we tried to have as many different MBA, professional MBA students on campus at any one time, because whether you started the program uh, in January, let's, let's say in April 2020, when we've got our next set of classes in Manchester, the way we look at it, whether you started your MBA in January 2020, or whether you started your MBA in July of 2018, still great for you to draw upon each other's networks, for you to meet, meet each other. So we are trying to hold as many different classes at the same time. Uh, of course, we're very, we're very fortunate that we're able to do that because we've got one of the largest campus-based business school in the UK. We just spent £85 million on a, on a new building. So we've got, the, we've got the facilities to hold a number of classes. 
But they, again, the benefit there is everyone is everyone is mixing together. We try to bring in a number of professional speakers from CO, COOs to managing directors of uh, huge retail organisations to aviation companies. What we've also done, and this is a this is an interesting one, the way that the way that you framed the question, Darren, you said about you know how do they feel in terms of part of the school. So we looked at it about four or five years ago, and you know I touched on this the last time we spoke in a podcast. We felt the network of our professional MBAs is so impressive. We feel that our full time MBA students are not able to utilize it utilize that network as much as that they as they should and it would be such a great benefit to them so what we started to do was now offer electives so our professional mba electives that we would offer them out to our full-time mbas so if our full-time mbas who are based in manchester they want to go and attend a class uh, in singapore or hong kong they could go in to the uh, classroom with our professional MBA students. And now that work, the feedback from that has been has been incredible because the the full time MBA students are being exposed to a uh, a very senior network audience, which is of benefit to them. And the professional MBA students are also being exposed to what they consider to be a different type of audience who are who who are generally younger so that's that that's worked very well and we have tried to integrate uh, as much as as possible yeah and and on that note i have two questions on the educational experience itself right because as you kind of outlined there's this whole spectrum of classes from all face to face to all online and i'm wondering what has been the feedback from your, your blended MBA students on taking classes online and, and the quality of instruction? Do they feel like they're able to get as much, you know, from sheer knowledge standpoint as taking those classes, you know, in person? Yeah. So that's, um, that's a very fascinating question. I think, and I think one that your, that your listeners should pay should pay close attention to because I actually think um, it is a common misconception that and maybe it's maybe it's the fault of business schools maybe it's the fault of the business education industry in terms of how we are educating professionals as to you know what what a class looks like. Um, to give you an example, okay, let, let's go back to those traditional, or to, to those fully online programs. Of course, if you're doing a fully online uh, MBA, you are going to be doing all your teaching online. Goes without doubt, the clues in the name. But then the lines begin, and then of course, if you're doing the traditional executive, it's all face to face, all face to face. That's why you're committing such uh, an amount of, of time on campus. But then anything in between that becomes to be, I think, becomes a bit blurred. And this is where I think your viewers who are interested in undertaking an MBA whilst they continue to work is where they need to do some some real in-depth research. So let's take and I'm going to I'm going to talk about um, the Manchester, the Manchester MBA here. But I think I think the basic principle can be applied to other programs. So let's take a course on the Manchester Global uh, on, on 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 the Manchester Full Time MBA. Let's take marketing. So marketing would be delivered on our full time MBA program two hours two hours a week for a term. So that's thirty hours of face to face contact with the academic in the classroom. In terms of the marketing course on our Manchester Global MBA, it is delivered in terms of the the face-to-face -face teaching, it is generally a six-month course, but in terms of the face-to-face -face element, it's in three very intensive days where you would be taught for about 24, 25 hours for that course. Now, that's still less than the 30 hours on the full-time program. So what we do to complement that is we usually deliver a couple of live online sessions, maybe one before 
the the class maybe a, you know three four weeks before a class maybe one three four weeks after a class for about two two and a half hours each which brings it up to 30 hours but i think the key i, th- I think what the interesting thing there is the bias is very much on the face to face isn't it the bias is not on the online side of things so i think a piece of advice for the listeners is to look at look at that detail when you're researching the programs. Is it going to be fully online study? If it's going to be, if there's some face to face, how many you know? Go into the detail. How many how many hours are there in terms of face to face? I've given you insight there to how it works in terms of our core courses on the Manchester MBA. I often um, speak with candidates as well. So for some people. 30 days face-to-face contact over a two-year period is too much. They might, they maybe don't want a fully online program and they might be edging more towards those programs where you've got about 10, 14 days over a two-year period. But what I often say to them is, well, we have now developed fully online elective courses. So there are ways to reduce the amount of face-to-face contact. So... Off the top of my head, you can probably get down to around 18 days of face-to-face contact on the Manchester Global MBA, uh, theoretically by by being uh, cute with how you pick your electives, etc., picking them uh, to be to be online. And it's been a great benefit from our programs or from a school's perspective, where we can offer those opportunities to to professionals. The interesting thing here, though, is, Darren, is you say that at the start when someone's considering an MBA program, they go, oh, that's great because, you know, I've got the option of, of doing 30, but I think I'm going to, you know, I'm going to reduce it by 10 by picking some online courses. And that's how they go into the Manchester Global MBA. And then after they attend their first five days in January or first five days in July, and they follow that with the six days in, in, in April or six days in September if they join in July, they realize that's the value of the MBA. That's the highlight of the program. That's where their fees are going. So although we are offering, offering these, free, uh, these fully online courses, the reality, the reality is the majority of our students are still choosing to come on campus once they've experienced it. But from my perspective, it's great to offer both options on the table when before they start. But I think, again, that's testament to the quality of the education that they receive, whether they're in Manchester, Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai or Sao Paulo. Yeah, it's so interesting to me that because of your size and all your locations and different formats that you offer, you guys can actually collect a lot of revealing and telling data, as you've shared with us, about what the market or your students are demanding. And on that note, like as you have all these places where MBA students can take courses, right, um, all over Asia, Sao Paulo, Dubai, et cetera, I'm wondering if you've seen any demand you know, more demand for any certain location? Uh, that's that's a small question. But my bigger question is, like, how do you maintain the quality of your faculty when you have so many different locations? I'm just wondering how, how, how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's funny that I'm, I'm sure probably, you know, your, your, your listeners are thinking, well, they've, they've rehearsed these questions, which we, we, we actually haven't. We've no. not even discussed them, have we, Darren? Nope. And, um that's also a very, very good point, and one that again I'm going to advise the listeners to think about and to research this. So the model that we have had since 1992 is that of a flying faculty model. So when we wanted to be the pioneers in transnational education, and and whilst we've wanted to retain that we have had to ensure the quality of the delivery of our program, of our MBA program. And what we, what we don't do, which some schools will do, is we don't hire local academics. So if you're, 
So if you live if you live in in Bangkok and you're taking your classes in Singapore, or if you live in I don't know in in Bahrain and you're taking your classes in in Dubai, you're not going to be taught by a a local academic. That's not to that's not to try and put any criticism on on local local academics. We've got world there's world class academics all over the world. But what we wanted to do differently was to say, you will, whether you're in Dubai, whether you're in Singapore, you will be taught by the exact same academics who are teaching students in Manchester. And that has, and I think that has proven to be very successful. Again, we're in a fortunate position there because of the size of our school. You know, we were... It was Alliance Manchester Business School, London Business School, the first two schools to be established uh, in the UK. So we've grown and grown since 1965. And we're in that position being the largest UK campus-based business school where we have the resources to have these quality academics on our MBA programs that can teach in Manchester and and all over the world. Yeah, no, that that's that's... I think that's a great point. And again, I, I love how you've highlighted certain questions that, you know, people considering a professional MBA should should really consider. And I just want to to summarize some of those again. So again, how many uh, in-person days are there in the program? Uh, how many hours of face-to-face um, learning are there in the program? And uh, also, yeah, where are your professors from? But I also want yeah. to to... Uh, shine the spotlight on your Kelly Manchester Global MBA. So that's a combination of of both business schools. And I think, you know, a question I have, and I'm sure many applicants have is like, what are, what are the true advantages to getting, I guess you would call it what, a dual MBA yeah. where, you know, two schools are offering the MBA? Like, do your students get an MBA degree from both schools and access to both networks? And what sort of advantages are there to have two schools uh, providing your MBA education? Yeah, yeah. So they do get a MBA, uh, an MBA certificate from the Kelly School of Business, and they also get a MBA certificate from uh, Alliance Manchester Business School, University of Manchester. So for some people, that is that is a benefit, but I think. One of the greater benefits there is how this how this has come about. So, I spoke about our partners and colleagues at the Kelly School of Business earlier on. You know, they are. You know, I, I think just just last week they were ranked the number one online MBA in 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 the US. And what they do so well is the online teaching. I don't think I'm out of place when I say this in that they can lay a claim to be the best in the world in terms of online teaching for professional MBAs. And for us, again, I've mentioned it a couple of times how we've been pioneers in, 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 in transnational education and how we built that model of, yes, you think that there's a, a huge element of online study, but the reality is in terms of the actual in terms of the actual teaching the majority of the teaching is face to face and the mod- and that teaching that is delivered face to face is delivered to the exact same quality standards all over the world where we're, where we're located so we look so we both both of us looked at this as a relationship where where we can take the best out of the about from the Kelly MBA, which is the online element, and we take the best out of the Manchester MBA, which is the face-to-face element, and combine them together. So half the course is split up from courses delivered purely by the Kelly School of Business, and it's delivered fully online, and then half the courses are delivered by Manchester, uh, and they are delivered at all of our global locations. And then, again, Going back to the days that has about that has eighteen days of face to face contact in total, so what you will what you will find there is for those candidates who are thinking wow you know doing 
doing 70, 80 days on an executive MBA, that's 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 too much. Going every evening uh, or you know a few evenings a week to my local business school is not really attractive to me. For those people who are thinking, you know, I like a structure of a of a program with about 30 days face to face contact, but it's still a bit too much for me. This program works works well for those individuals as well. Yeah, and actually, one question I have about how the class actually works for your professional uh, MBA. You mentioned that, for example, if I'm taking a core marketing course, there's going to be three intensive days where, you know, I'm in class for 24 hours, but that's spread out over six months. And I'm wondering what happens? Like, can you just break down one class, how that is structured over six months? Like, yeah, yeah, just of course. The face, the face to face time and the and the online study and, and projects. So, because I think that will also be a great signal for listeners whether they like yeah. that format or or not. Yeah, absolutely. So we mentioned the three days uh, intensive residential workshops. What we what we I also mentioned that you the students are assessed there. So in terms of how assessment works on our program, is generally. 25% for a individual assignment uh, before you come to a to a class. Then 50% is focused on a group assignment and group presentation during the res- during the residential period. And finally, there's 25% for a second individual assignment. We moved away from examinations about three, three, four years ago. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's certainly a lot of debate in in higher education at the moment, especially in terms of are examinations the best way to be teaching senior practitioners? Uh, because I think the key is really about how you apply that knowledge to your workplace, how you apply that knowledge to your industry, uh, not how you necessarily can memorize out of out of different textbooks. So that's the way we build our 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 assignments that there there's real life application out of them. So wait, hold um, on. Can I just oh, highlight that? So there's no there's no exams in your professional MBAs. No. Wow, uh, we I, ha- we have moved away from that's, that. Yes, that's wow. That's a whole other podcast in itself. But okay, yeah, <laughs> please continue on. <laughs> um, do you know what I forgot? What I was going to say now. <laughs> um, where, where where were we there? So you were um, saying yeah, how sorry, the, the, yeah. the six months. Yes. So in terms of what we also develop for our students is what we would call a study guide. And in that study guide, there's basically a week by week what everyone should be doing. And if you follow that study guide, just that study guide, you're you're going to do enough to pass the MBA. But again, we're we're in a good fortunate position that the type of professionals that we that we recruit are very very ambitious. They're top quality candidates, and they they are looking for more than just to pass the MBA. So we also give the additional resources and show them if you're looking for those merits and distinctions, this is how you get it. You've got you've got the resources to to company reports, market reports, all these academic journals. How you integrate these into your assignments is how you are going to achieve the highest possible grades. Um, so a lot of of that time is working is working remotely in terms of doing the there's there's often pre reading required before coming into class. It's not a case of you fly into you fly into Manchester and. Uh, that's the first time you're opening a textbook or your laptop, etc. Now we 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 require uh, a lot of work going into things pre uh, pre pre workshop. What we also do and try to facilitate is to have study groups. So whether that individuals living in the same same city, uh, same country, and it doesn't doesn't even have to be that you know day and age where everyone's got whatsapp everyone's got skype etc you'll have study groups of i i was i was speaking to um to one student a few uh, towards the end of last year he said he said he had 27 different um mba whatsapp groups 
So from different courses to his project groups to people in, in a specific industry. But going back to the, to the study groups, that's where you want people to be working together, uh, sharing best practice. I found, I, you know, I've, I found this journal, I think it works well, et cetera, et cetera. But also, we've been focusing on core courses uh, and, and some of the electives for the majority of this call when we've, when we've gone into that. What we haven't really touched on is, the, is, is that there's two different projects running through the MBA. So you've got a live business, pro, uh, sorry, a business simulation project in the first 12 months and then a live business project in the final 12 months. Both of those are group projects. So the amount of group work that has been done on the MBA is very high over that two-year period. So you would be looking, and I, you know, this is this is how I generally advise about ten to fifteen hours of what I would class as self-study per week. Now, whether that is being involved in online forums, whether that's actually working on your individual assignments, whether it's doing pre-workshop reading, whether it is you're spending a couple of hours on on some academic journals. That's the, uh, that's the amount of time generally required uh, for someone to, to do well on the MBA. Of course, that's going to change from, uh, from week to week. It's not uh, 10 to 15 hours must be done. It's more of a case of that's a, good, that's a good guide. But we also know our students are very, very busy professionals. There's going to be key times in work where you might only be able to focus a couple of hours on your MBA that week. That happens. That happens to probably all of our students. There's going to be times where students want to go take a two-week vacation with their families. Again, it makes sense. You just need to do some good planning, plan ahead, make sure you do some good work before you go on that vacation, and you will end up completing your MBA successfully. Yeah, that 10 to 15 hours on average as a guide is super helpful. Thanks for sharing that. And my my last question to you, Chris, is we've talked about how you've seen the market evolve and how Manchester has evolved to stay relevant and serve its students. Where do you see the future going with your suite of MBA programs? How do you see them further okay. evolving? So um, well, I'm... Um, I've got I've got two things in my head at the moment, so I'll give a simple one uh, to start with. In terms of curriculum, etc., we continuously evolve the curriculum. We you've got what I class as traditional courses, things such as negotiation skills, supply chain management, negotiation skills on the curriculum twenty years ago, on the curriculum now. It's also going to be then twenty years. Whatever happens in business. There's going to be some individuals that require to have those specific skills. Over the last few years, we've developed new electives in uh, current topical electives in things such as managing disruptive technologies, the digital economy, uh, big data, big data analytics. Whereas now we're focusing, we're developing things on AI, on cryptocurrencies that are going to be integrated to the elective curriculum from 20, I think it might be July 2020 or certainly in 2021, developing new courses on, on CSR, sustainability. You know, Manchester is ranked uh, number one in the UK in terms of how sustainability and CSR is integrated into our MBA programs, uh, number three in the world. So that's a, that's a big factor for us. Although... Uh, and then the second point, I think the second point, how I see the market evolving, I think this one, maybe the first bit of that answer, I would, I think I'd expect, um, you, you listeners should expect that from a, from all world-class business schools to be keeping a, 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 a curriculum topical and relevant. But I think maybe a, a bit of insight that I can share with, with the listeners here is, I've spoken a couple of times already. Average age generally is about 36 on executive MBAs. It's, the average age is 36 on our global MBA as well. But what we're seeing now is younger candidates applying for the program. The amount of CVs my team receives, the amount of people that I meet around the world who give you their CVs and you 
you instinctively look at it and go, wow, this profile looks amazing. This person, and this, this is how your brain's working, or certainly after 15 years of doing this anyway, you're thinking, wow, this, this, this person's great. They're going, good opportunity of getting a scholarship for our full-time MBA. And then they go, no, no, I'm not interested in a full-time MBA. I'm interested in doing a MBA whilst I continue to work. So just towards the end of last year, we did a, a an event for some prospective MBA students. Uh, we had one individual, uh, one of our students who had about 15, 20 years of experience speaking. But then we, what we also had is what we would class some of these newer applicants that we see. So he was someone, he started the program at 26. He worked for Amazon, so already worked for a big global organization. And he could have got on to most top MBA programs in the world, I'd say, because of his caliber. But again, he was in an industry that he really liked. He could see the opportunities there. So he felt he did not need to leave the labor market to pursue an MBA in that he could do both at the same time. And when you consider how, again, going back to how we started this conversation, to the amount of options now that are available, I've said this before at a conference and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it now. In my opinion, there's never been a better time for a professional to undertake an MBA whilst they continue to work. And the reason I say that is, one, because of the amount of options available to students in terms of different program types. And two, uh, and again, this could be another whole different conversation, is the amount of different world-class business schools offering these types of programs now. If you think, again, 15, 20 years ago, it was that you, you had some top quality business schools, such as Manchester Business School, such as the Kelly School of Business, who are pioneering this. But some of the other top, some of our other colleagues from uh, schools who are equally as good were not necessarily in that market at that time. They have now developed, whether it's online MBAs, whether it's modular-based MBAs, whether it's distance MBAs, whether it's new global executive MBAs. So the amount of options available now from world-class business schools makes it a lot more accessible because, you've, again, you've got different fee levels as well. That's something we've not really covered. Mm. Uh, you know, yeah. you can do an online MBA. There's a, there's a top school in Boston who just uh, released a, a fully online MBA. I think it's like $25,000. Uh, some of the highest, most expensive global executive MBAs come in at about 100 and 150,000 euros, pounds. Well, and then for us, what we've done is because of the scale of our program, because of our global reach, we've been very fortunate to be able to keep quite a competitive price point. So, we're, so, so our program is priced at 30,000 pounds. When you look at the ranking of Manchester Business School, one of the top 50 MBAs in the world, one of the top five MBAs uh, in the UK. That's a very attractive price point. But again, the point there is more about the different level fee levels available, which again makes it accessible for a larger amount of students. So, yeah, I think they... Uh, so exciting times for those who are wanting to embark on an MBA uh, whilst continuing continuing to work. Yeah, I think that's a great place to end our conversation. I mean, that last comment has got me thinking that there's also a huge opportunity for us at, at Touch MBA because of the explosion of options. It must be so intimidating as well for students to find the right option that meets their budget and uh, logistic uh, schedules and, and so forth. So... Yeah, we'll try to do our part to help out there as well. And Chris, I want to thank you so much for opening the curtain and giving us uh, uh, more of an inside view of what's going on with all these different programs. And I think you know many of our listeners will find this episode very helpful. So thank you so much uh, for your time and, and sharing your experience. No problem, Darren. Thank you. Thank you very much for for having me. And uh, you know, I hope I hope the listeners have been able to provide some insight to them. What I'll say to, to everyone listening, 
if you're thinking of doing a professional MBA and, you know, even if you just want general advice, really, you, we, we do not even have to speak about the Manchester MBA. Drop me a message or something on LinkedIn. Drop me an email. I'm more than more than happy to help individuals select the right type of MBA, uh, the right program structure, the right, the right business school for them. Manchester isn't the right business school for everyone. And that's why I'm saying I'd be more than happy to help anyone with general advice. Wow, that's so generous of you. I'll be sure to um, put some links to you know, your LinkedIn and, and of course, Manchester MBA. So if they want to talk to your office, they can as well. So thank you so much, Chris. No problem. Thank you very much once again, Darren. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.